As the warden of Merton College, it's my very great pleasure to invite you all then to attend tonight's Merton Conversation, The Challenges of Global Finance. And I want to explain what a hugely significant event this is. This year, 2014, is the 750th anniversary of the college. That is to say, the anniversary of the foundation of our college. And Merton College, its charters and its statutes have laid down a template that colleges through time right around the world have copied and emulated. And I want you to know that we are immensely proud of that fact. And then the amazing fact is that tonight's event is the very first in our celebrations program for this anniversary. So as it were in football parlance, we would say the, the kickoff takes place in Hong Kong. And I think that that's, that's a wonderful way for things to be. I've always viewed Merton College, the fellows, the staff, the students and the alumni as a large family. And it's therefore, I think, very right and very significant that the kickoff should take place out here in Hong Kong, where we have such a vibrant alumni base. It's just the way that things should be. Our celebrations program, I hope most of you have now seen it, read it and studied it, falls into four natural parts. There's the summer ball, there's the Merton birthday weekend, which is the 13th and 14th of September, and there's a little fact I, I find astonishing in all of that, and this is that we know the exact day, the 14th of September, 1264, when the fellows took possession of Malden Manor and Merton College came into existence. So it's wonderful that we can have a birthday party on that exact day, 750 years on. So though, I've told you now two components, the ball and the birthday weekend. There's a very substantial music component, but there's also the Merton Conversations, and of course that's what brings us here today. Altogether, in our celebratory programme, there's going to be six of these Merton Conversations. So there's one here in Hong Kong tonight, there'll be four in the rest of the United Kingdom, and there'll be one for our alumni in New York. And it's really quite astonishing to see just how nicely tonight's Merton Conversation will dovetail and fit into the second Merton Conversation, which of course will take place in Merton College in the T.S. Eliot Lecture Theatre. So now let me start by telling you what the title of that one is. That is called China and the West, Culture and Society. So that already is a good fit with being in Hong Kong for the first. But then we go on. The two discussants for that second conversation will be Lord Patton, the former governor of Hong Kong and now chancellor of the University of Oxford. And the second discussant will be my predecessor, Dame Jessica Rawson, so she was the former warden and is a world leading sinologist. So as I say, that's an absolutely perfect follow on to what we've got tonight. So this, as it were, frames tonight's event. I am delighted to welcome Al Race here, who is going to be our moderator for this evening. Presently, Al, I think you're going to introduce the other three discussants, but before we get going, I should just say a little word about Al. Al himself is a journalist, is a consultant, and a visiting professor at the University of Hong Kong. So, Al, thank you very much for helping us organize all of this. I now hand over to Al, but Al, right at the end, if you would sort of call me up to close matters down and say thank you, I would be very grateful. And, and, and I'm wondering, I, I, I can't see at time, and like, like uh, in the mobile age, I don't wear a watch anymore. So, you like so. <laughs> That's what wardens do. <laughs> Very nice, thank you. Make sure you get it back, Patrick. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll, I'll have it There's sold before, 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 the, before the evening is over. Uh, thank you. So anyway, at this point, over to you then, Alan yes, the team. Thank, thank you. you. 
Uh, thank you, Smartin. Um, good evening to everybody. Uh, it's a privilege and a pleasure for me to um, moderate this uh, first Merton conversation. Um, I'm grateful to the college and to the warden for asking me to fill this role. We would like this evening to be as much as possible a true conversation. So um, there are no speeches, no statements. We'll just sort of launch right into it. Um, the choice of topic, the challenges for global finance is a fairly obvious one and an apt one uh, to have here in Hong Kong. Um, so, and, and at the beginning of the year, uh, and on the threshold of the year of the horse, it, it, it's an appropriate time to take stock of what's going on. And, and there are many things that are going on um, in the world today, in, in the world of finance, uh, not least, uh, of course, um, there are concerns about what's going on in China with the uh, levels of debt. There's uh, the, the Fed with a new chairman uh, coming in and the, um, uh, the um, taper of the um, uh, stimulus. Uh, so there are many issues that uh, we will touch on uh, and uh, we certainly have an, an excellent panel for that. Um, and the context of, uh, of our discussion is certainly well known to you uh, with the crisis uh, now five years old. Though, of course, you know, given Merton's long history, 750 years, one might think that we should be discussing tonight the tulip mania uh, of 16, uh, 377 years ago. So, I mean, Merton has such a long perspective that maybe that might be uh, a, a good starting point. But no worries, we won't reach that far back. In fact, we want to look as forward as possible. Um, Mertonian poet T.S. Eliot, who um, I believe he won some prize for literature that they give out in Sweden. Um, if you, he, he said, if you aren't in over your head, how do you know how tall you are? And in some ways, since we were well, all well over our heads during the crisis, uh, the question is, do we now know how tall we are? And have we done enough to address our deficiencies, uh, our, our, our shortfalls? So our panel is uh, well known to you all, but I'll take some, a little bit of time to introduce them. Uh, to the, um, my far right there, uh, Sir Callum McCarthy is a Mertonian, uh, the only Mertonian uh, on the dais at the moment. Um, he was CEO of the Barclays Group Operations in Japan and then headed the bank's operations in North America. Um, he was the Director General of Offgas and then Chief Executive of Offgem, uh, the industry super regulator. Um, he was chairman of the UK Financial Services Authority from 2003 to 08, uh, and he's currently the non-executive chairman of Promontory Financial Group and sits on the board of ICBC, um, the Chinese bank that is the biggest in the world. Um, Liu Minggang uh, is currently a distinguished fellow at the Fung Global Institute, and I believe you teach at the uh, Chinese University as well. Uh, before that, he was, of course, um, from 2003 to 2001, uh, to 2011, uh, chairman of the China Banking Regulatory Commission. And previous to that, he headed Bank of China, was chairman of China Everbright, was a vice governor of the People's Bank of China, and a vice governor of China Development Bank. Um, and to my immediate right, uh, Charles Li Xiaojia uh, is a lawyer with a J degree from um, Columbia University. He is chief executive of Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing, uh, has been since 2010. Previously, he was chairman of JP Morgan uh, China and president of uh, Merrill Lynch China before that. Um, so, uh, uh, Mr. Lee, of course, is at the forefront of the fight to maintain Hong Kong's competitiveness as a financial center. So it's very appropriate that uh, he should be here. One last message before I go to the panel. The conversation includes you. So I really encourage you to think of questions right now. I, I, I sought some inspiration from another Mertonian, uh, that country minstrel Chris Christofferson, who said, um, all I'm taking is your time. Help me make it through the night. Although I know that Chris Christofferson had another um, a mission in, uh, involved rather than to moderate a session. But please help us make it through the night by thinking up of your questions because uh, we will go to the, um, to, to the audience uh, fairly quickly uh, to ask for your comments and questions. Now, to start, I, I would like to ask the um, panelists, uh, uh, starting with Sir Callum, um, what is the key challenge that you see or the key challenges that you see for global finance at this start of 2014? Oh, thank you for that introduction. I should just make one thing clear. Um, as chairman of the FSA, I did preside over the first 
run on a British bank for 170 years. So I think I should just put that on the record <laughs> in the, in the uh, interest of honesty. Um, Very fair. Um, in terms, I'd, I'd like to identify three sets of issues. Um, the first one is a macroeconomic issue, which is that in dealing with the extraordinary dangerous situation that we had in 2008, when the world was teetering absolutely on the edge of financial disaster, and managed to come back from the edge, but where financial problems moved into a huge economic depression around the world, which affected every country in the world, the reaction to that has not been fiscal. It has been monetary action, and it has been monetary action on a scale and in a form which is completely unprecedented. And it has taken the form of two things. One is qualitative easing, <coughs> the fact that principally the Fed, the Fed, Bank of England, <coughs> to some extent the ECB, now has $3 trillion, which it didn't have on their balance sheets before. And this has had all sorts of effects in terms of depressing some prices, inflating others, and it cannot continue. And the second thing is that we have official interest rates at completely unprecedented levels, essentially approaching zero. And in the, in the coming year, we are going to see the start of the unwinding of that, something that has never, because it has never been done before, it has never had to be undone before, and that is a time of acute vulnerability. We saw last year when Bernanke mentioned the possibility of this happening, the, the ripple effects of that spread throughout emerging markets immediately. When it actually happens this year, it is going to have all sorts of effects. So that's the first thing. The second thing I'd say is a regulatory issue. If you go back to the days which both <coughs> Lumin Kang and I will remember well when we were regulators in, say, 2005, Central banks, politicians, regulators, economists thought that we knew the answers. We had a regulatory framework that had managed to deal with some huge crises and pressures. It had dealt with two, two Gulf Wars. It had dealt with the biggest one-day fall in stock market prices. It had dealt with the biggest asset bubble in history. And it had done quite well. And we thought we had the answers. And we now know that those answers <coughs> don't work because we, they led to a terrible crisis. And we have to recreate <coughs> a world of a new framework. And we've got questions which simply have not yet been answered. Questions like, how much capital do we really want banks to hold? The intellectual case for holding much more capital than presently has been defined is overwhelming but we, we're not nearly there for very good practical reasons. The question of how you get international regula national regulators to cooperate, something that didn't work in 2008 as a moment of crisis, needs to be dealt with. We've got to deal with the <coughs> acute concentration risk which happens through the concentration into a limited number of exchanges around the world and a limited number of clearinghouses. And that's an acute concentration risk. And there are a series of other questions like that where we've got to find new answers. So getting those regulatory answers is going to, not all of which we will get right, is going to impose all sorts of pressures on financial institutions. And the third, third thing that concerns me <coughs> is I think that banks themselves have got to re-examine their business model. They're going to have to hold more capital. They're going to be faced with requirements to be treat their customers in a different way. They are going to be required to split their businesses. There are going to be all sorts of pressures on them, including the pressure from totally new entrants to the business. One, I was talking to a non-executive director on a very large World Bank, who said to me, you know, the real problem for banks is how we avoid going the way of departmental stores and just getting disintermediated out of business. So for that 
particular set of financial institutions, I don't think there are some very real business model questions. Those are my three answers to your question. Thank questions. you very much. Um, Mr. Leo? Okay. Uh, I think people living in this century do not fear hardship. If we are looking forward for the whole year this year, uh, we do not fear any challenges or difficulties. <coughs> but one thing is scary. That is, if we have a poor international cooperation, <coughs> that could be a big issue. You know, uh, talking about tapering off of the QE and the possible impacts upon the newly emerging markets. Yeah, it's a huge waves. And also, if you talk about something like shadow banking <coughs> or money laundry activities, if you really want to do your homework, like uh, you know, supervisory college, and uh, and also a lot of things like uh, RRP, uh, recovery and the revolution planning, the living will. If you really <coughs> want all this stuff are functioning, you do need a better international cooperation. But I'm very sorry to say that after five or six years after this world price <coughs> crisis. When we are facing great rotation, not only in the risk appetites, but the great rotation of products, tools in using, and the policies, and even embedded in analysis, and also the great capital flows the worldwide, what we could see is the gap is very wide between us <coughs> and the goals set by the G20 five or six years ago. Let's, uh, let me quickly go through that. <coughs> During the first summit in Washington, D.C., the G20 leaders committed to implement policies saying that we got to strengthen the transparency and accountability, and we got to enhancing sound regulation. We got to promote integrity in financial markets, and uh, we got to reinforcing international cooperations, and the last but not least, the reforming international financial institutions. And the moreover, they further required no financial markets, products, and the participants <coughs> remained unregulated or not subject to oversight. So judged by that, and we can see the gap is very wide between us and the goal set up. So not even close. So not to mention we got to face great rotation, great capital flow caused by tapping or even reverse operation of QEs and so many other things. So anti-money laundry, anti-terror financing, and uh, also we are talking about uh, even accounting systems. You know. We talked uh, so many years about the possible convergence of ISB and FSB, but uh, they got still nowhere. So this, this is something really worry in people's minds. So that is the story behind many stories, but it is the key issue and concern for mine. So simply put, we need a better international cooperation. Thank you very much. Steve? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I have to uh, confess <coughs> that before I came here today, I thought it was going to have a pretty relaxed evening <laughs> and, uh, and uh, just chatting about something I know, uh, about Hong Kong, about Hong Kong exchange, you know, which most of the time I don't have to use too much of my brain because <coughs> I've said it uh, often enough. Until I start to read uh, the, you know, the questions, uh, I apologize, I didn't read it early enough. <laughs> and then I know I'm going to be in deep, deep trouble, especially now that I heard about the 750-year history. So I'm humbled by this. And uh, so, um, so my initial reaction is I agree with that. <laughs> and that will be my comment. But if I have to really add <laughs> something on top of it, <clears throat> you know, I, I don't, I'm not an <clears throat> economist, so I don't really usually look at things 
you know, from an economic perspective, macro policy perspective. I'm a, a market operator. I focus on where I make the biggest difference and what impacts me on my business, on my players, on my market. Um, but if I have to, you know, put myself a little bit away and look at this, <coughs> um, I, I, I think the biggest uh, issue uh, is a, a, a very big divide, a couple of very big divide. The divide <coughs> between the various market. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a very big contradiction. On the one hand, you know, you have a number of markets that are completely <coughs> driven by very different fundamental economic priorities, economic issues, and points of cycles. And then, you know, the, the whole crisis started where the strongest economy and strongest financial system sits and is almost blow it apart. And that triggers a global recession, a global financial crisis that took a number of years to unfold in different velocity and different pace and different uh, form. <coughs> and, uh, you know, so by the time the U.S. blow up is contained, you know, massive <coughs> aggressive action was taken. And then, you know, the other crisis start to brew, and, you know, in Europe and then Japan. And then we thought Europe is going to be on the edge of the abyss. Somehow it managed to come back. <coughs> we don't even know how it came back. And uh, uh, so, so today, now you have the U.S. who is trying to, as you said, coming out of it. And it's the reverse of the stuff that they have been doing while everybody else is probably on a very, very different cycle. And the U.S. system is quite resilient. You know, they have done tremendous <coughs> aggressive uh, you know, uh, work early on in resulting in substantial destruction of value at certain pockets, but very quickly get over it. It's almost like a very big diary. It's get it over and moved on. Where well, the other system are not able, the Europe in particular, and to lesser extent Japan, do not want to do what the radical surgery that, uh, that the U.S. went through, and that they wanted to continue to see whether they can just uh, you know, uh, stumble through. So a lot of the issues are still there. You know, somehow they use monetary policy and uh, you know, physical um, you know, kind of uh, uh, cover your eyes, and to, <coughs> seems to have got to this far. And uh, they have a very, very different priority. If you hear from Ge Geithner yesterday, you, know, you can see that uh, <coughs> what the U.S. is worried about and what Europeans are worried about, what the Japanese are worried about, and what the Chinese are worried about, they all are at very different points of history of their cycle. They, you know, sometimes they reacted to it, sometimes they anticipated, sometimes they were driven by their own domestic Meanwhile, while all these different priorities are taking different policies and doing different things and sometimes canceling each other out, sometimes reinforcing each other, sometimes creating something completely different, why all of this is happening? You have the global market, the global finance are completely globalized, heavily integrated, <coughs> meaning that you know, money is just really is able to flow between borders and between countries in much faster pace with a much less constraint and uh, with regulator have very limited real oversight as to how the money is going and why they are moving and uh, creating all this anxiety. So the first divide is really, you know, different machines are operating very differently where the gasoline <coughs> is actually moving quite freely. The oil is moving quite freely between the different machines. And you wonder, and you you know you know you you know you you, know, you, you, can, you know you wonder whether or not one day that divide that flow is getting to a point where you know a machine has to be moving very fast, but the oil is just not going there anymore, and it's going to blow up, and you know in a different form or shape. So that's uh, you know one big divide that uh, you know another divide is really <coughs> reality vis-a-vis -vis economic analysis. You know you have you know, you know I remember last year and part of the year before, every European uh, commercial uh, financial leaders come to Hong Kong, usually visit me, and visit the exchange, and the question I ask is about the European crisis. Because no matter how you look at it, it looks like they're gonna have to go down the, uh, the cliff because there's just no way out unless you send German tax collectors to Greek. You know, you just won't, you know, but somehow they managed to, to come out of it and nobody even explained as to 
was it a real scare that was rationally articulated? Or was it real something and then something was really done and then eventually prevented us from going down there? Or the whole crisis was actually artificially inflated in the first place? It was ne really never as bad as it was. And it's actually, there's some easy solutions. The Germans just used the process to scare everybody, to bring everybody to the edge of the cliff. See, is it horrible <coughs> down there? And then let's not do it, move back. And then other people still don't want to do the tough thing. The Germans went there and said, oh, it's actually quite scary for us ourselves. So we might as well print money and, uh, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and stop being serious about it. So we don't really know what is reality, <coughs> what, is vision, what is illusion. And uh, that is horrible for finance because finance is all about expectation. It's about how people anticipate how the market is going to do and in order to do something. But if people really have drastically different views of the world, and it's all turned out to be, no matter what kind of analysis you put up with, something else happens, and you come back and retell the story. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if we can, since, since you brought up Europe, if, if I can uh, start there in opening up the discussion. Um, so, Carol, I'm, I'm wondering if you might be able to comment on that, on, on, on where you see Europe uh, at the moment. Um, We've, we, we now have uh, uh, some kind of framework for a uh, banking union. There's discussion about um, some resolution uh, mechanism. And we, of course, ha now have uh, Greece uh, taking the six months pres presidency. Um, are we over the crisis in Europe, or has the can simply been just um, uh, kicked down the road? The remarkable thing in Europe, in terms of the euro and the eurozone, is that through one statement by that deeply impressive man, Mario Draghi, who said, I must tell you, we will do everything that is necessary to save the euro. That had an extraordinary effect. And it was extraordinary <coughs> because if you ask, well, what are the levers that Mario can pull that will actually have some result? It's a very difficult question to answer. <coughs> and <coughs> if you look at what has happened, the problems, the, the fundamental economic problems in Europe have become, have, arri have arisen because of concentration of things that should not be brought together <coughs> because of the yoking together of different national economies which do not have enough consistency to have a single currency. The result, however, has been that the European Commission has been very good at not allowing a major crisis to go past without taking opportunity of it. And the, even though the problem has been excessive bringing together, <coughs> the result has been the great step forward to further concentration. And you see it in terms of greater power for the Commission to supervise <coughs> the actual economic policies of different member states, something which is politically dynamite. You see it in the fact that the ECB is going to be responsible for the supervision of major banks. You see it in that there is now a bank resolution <coughs> scheme. And one day, there will be a Eurozone-wide uh, deposit <coughs> insurance scheme. Um, the difficulty about it is that that goes absolutely in the contrary direction to all the politics. The politics is that people in every member state increasingly do not like Europe. It's a remarkable thing in the UK that whereas five years ago, if anybody had been asked, do you think there is a prospect that in the year 2020, the UK <coughs> will not be a member of the EU, any of us would have said that is a, a trivial probability. Today, it is a probability of something which everybody has to take into account. I don't know whether it's a 10% probability or a 30% probability. There's somewhere but of, of, of Britain, <coughs> the UK leaving the EU. That, that's the reality. Well, there's, there's going to be a referendum, or supposedly. Yes, there's and there's going to be a uh, there uh, <laughs> if this, this, this government is re-elected, and it is very likely that in the run-up to the election, other parties will also have to commit to a referendum. And if there were a referendum, nobody knows what the answer would be. So the politics, and it's not only in the UK, but the politics in the UK, in <coughs> France, in Italy, in Greece, obviously, in Spain to some extent, is increasingly uh, anti-European. 
nationalist. And yet we have, at the one hand, movement towards central powers going to Brussels, and the politics going in the opposite direction. And in terms of Charles's point about where is the reality, a very difficult question to answer. Neil, um, you have you had vast experience uh, with the China banking sector, and, 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 and indeed, under your watch, um, uh, I recall uh, an essay uh, you posted on the Fung Global Institute website, uh, and I think was published, um, where you likened yourself to the captain of the Titanic. Uh, but then you made it through uh, your uh, term in the CBRC, and that you were quite gratified that you achieved a lot of reforms and cleaned up balance sheets of the banks. Um, I'm wondering if you could look at the, the, the Titanic in Europe, and, 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 and what are your thoughts then uh, on where Europe is, and would you have any particular advice <coughs> given your experience with banking reform? I think it, uh, in my eyes, uh, the bank union is absolutely correct. That's a necessary approach to move on if you want to keep the union over there, and if you, especially for the Eurozone, the 18 countries, and. Uh, put them together, because nowadays the banking industry is very fragile, and the people's life suffered quite a lot after so many years. Yeah. You can witness some growth and progress, but if you look at the people, ordinary people, <coughs> if you talk with them, they will tell you a lot of suffering and scaring stories. So to change this phenomenon, we need a very strong bank union because we have the trade and the investment conformities. And I think that is a big move. And to put 130 plus banks yeah, in the Maria scheme, and that is absolutely correct. Because so far, if you look at that area, there's <coughs> only one organization with the credibility in the financial industry, that is ECB. They have the, you know, the, the credibility and they have the professional skills and knowledges and experience in dealing with all these things. So that is a marvelous movement. The problem is that, and <coughs> I don't think that is having, I don't think that's a lot of problems about that. A lot of people criticize that, um, the, how the central bank can do this supervisory job and the regulatory job in the <coughs> meantime. Uh, it, it will cause some uh, potential moral hazards because you got to have a demarcation line between to leave the monetary policy very independent. <coughs> yes, but uh, the actually if you look at uh, what they are doing, they're separate, uh, they set up the firewall in between. They're only a point one deputy governor from the ECB <coughs> to sit in the supervisory board as a member. And the chief executive will be appointed by the political committees and from the market to do <coughs> the supervisory job. So that it's only under the name in the umbrella, but actually they have the demarcation line. And um, also, I think they uh, they are thinking about the resolution and the recovery and, and deposit insurance schemes, unified the differences among 18 countries <coughs> in the Eurozone. So they have a marvelous and a wisdom packages to do their job. The problem I'm seeing is that this system got to be firmly supported by fiscal unit. That is the key point. But to bring the fiscal union into practice, you know, the biggest enemy is a politician. So the, what I'm looking at the, is the EU election, European election in this coming May, and to see after that what they would say and what kind of intervention into the real decision-making process. If we, the bank union can be closely more followed <coughs> by a correct fiscal union, not necessarily a quick process, but so long as we have a clear-cut roadmap, 
you can gather the confidence and trust from the market. And confidence is very important in today's fragile euro. And uh, we are very happy to see that <coughs> they are gathering the fiscal budget data coming from 18 countries in the euro zone. Not the EU, EU is 28 countries. And every country is supposed and obliged to report their fiscal budget to the. It's not, uh, you know, the, it's not a compulsory administrative order saying that you can do this or you can't do this. But anyway, on discretional basis, on negotiation basis, they will tell you what you can improve and what kind of limitations you are facing. And so this is a very moderate step forward they have already taken. The key point is if they could be followed by fiscal union or not. <coughs> Leading with the practice I have done and I've gathered in China, <coughs> when I wage the restructuring of the SOE banks and the restructuring more than 35,000 Lula <coughs> co-ops, the crap unions, very fragile, they were not working at that time. I was firmly backed by Ministry of Finance and the central banks. And they gave her the bridge, you know, financing and the funding. That is the money coming from the foreign change reserve. And I promise I will give every penny back in five years because, you know, once they are facing IPOs, with at that time, the Chinese banks can be successfully selling at a PB three times, or <coughs> even high 3.3 in Hong Kong market, and uh, with a sub firm support from Charles and his predecessors. And the market conditions before the Lehman Brothers it was excellent. So the the window, the time window is very important. So I think so long as it could be quickly followed by fiscal union, that could be a successful move. And, uh, but if not, uh, that could be a big question mark. So let's wait and see what happened in this coming May for the great election. So, so Tom, I just want to very quickly, just fiscal union, possibility, impossibility, non-starter. Um, I think it is terribly difficult. Um, can I just say that MK is absolutely right in, in his analysis. Everybody expects the May elections to result in a European Parliament with a much bigger Eurosceptic voice there. Um, in the UK, for example, it is expected that the anti-European party, UKIP, will do much better than the Conservative <coughs> Party in the, in the May ele European elections. An extraordinary feature for a party that is based around one <coughs> extraordinarily persuasive individual and has no, no member of the British Parliament. Um, I think that the, the real difficulty of saying you're going to have fiscal <coughs> union is that these decisions which are very difficult social decisions to reduce welfare spending, which is really the decision on fiscal policy mm. in, in a continent with an aging population and an underfunded pension uh, industry is really to say we're going to change that. And that's socially di very difficult indeed. For those decisions to be taken by Brussels is very difficult. <coughs> and the precedence of the Growth and Stability Pact is a very poor precedent for actually seeing anything happen that works. Um, Mr. Lee, I, I'm wondering if we can shift to... Uh, Before you shift, could yeah, I just uh, sure. uh, a comment yes. on that? You know, because you know, I, I don't really know. I don't have the answer, and I don't really know Europe that well. But the way I heard from all the people, you know, I seem <coughs> to walk away with you know, two... You know, one is a very pessimistic perspective, which is exactly... And, you know, the fundamentally, it's an unnatural thing for European countries to do what we are asking them to do to keep fiscal union, even though it's a rational thing to do. So pessimists <coughs> say, well, they will never get there because the fundamental DNA is just not there. The more 
you know, if you really, really have to be an uh, optimist, the only way I can see this whole thing work is simply the fear itself that you know euro <coughs> is becoming so important, euro is so important. It is the fear of the alternative that is going to be constantly deter you from doing what your heart tells you what to do. So basically, you know, hopefully euro is growing bigger and bigger and bigger incrementally over such a long period of time that no matter how you do it, anything else you do, the alternative <coughs> is so much worse than this bad alternative, then you ended up just to keep on stomping along and maybe one day and then you even change your own mind, you know, okay, I can reduce my pension, and, you know, benefit and entitlement and people die, who? I don't know, I don't know how it's gonna work out, but that's the only, the only optimistic I can make out of it is that it's the alternative. The reason the German did what they did is because they look at the cliff, they realize going down there, everybody is so much worse off, so maybe we just to keep on, keep on going. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Lee, I'm, I'm wondering if we, if we can shift to talking about, focusing a little bit on the tape, uh, on the taper, because this is, uh, was brought up uh, earlier. And, and from your perspective uh, uh, as chief executive of uh, Hong Kong X, um, uh, what are your concerns as the stimulus is unwound? I mean, we're just at the beginning of it. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I, you know, again, be very straight and honest. I don't care too much about it. I don't think too much about it simply because I don't have a whole lot of control over what happens. You know, whether or not I can influence it, <coughs> I don't have zero influence. If it has some impact to it, my market, is there anything I can do about it? There's very little I can do about it, so I don't study that issue, and I don't, I get asked about that issue all the time as if I can make a difference. I make <laughs> no difference, and I d usually don't try to figure out things that I don't make any difference. Thank Sorry. you very much, very, uh, very good uh, remark. Uh, uh, Mr. Kalama, your, your, your own concerns? Uh, you, you raised the issue. It's just, um, there are some people, Alan Blinder, who, the vice chairman of the Fed, tends to dismiss the unwinding <coughs> of QE. Says, look, we, we bought all these, the, these government stocks, we, we did it without any problem, we can sell them without any problem. The difficulty is that <coughs> The world is still in a very, very fragile state. And these things, rather like Charles, I, there's nothing I can do to influence it <laughs> at all. <laughs> but <coughs> I think there is every probability that the unwinding, the mistakes will be made. And when that happens, there will be effects on liquidity. There will be effects on liquidity, particularly in emerging markets. There will be a quite substantial reassessment again of debt versus equity which has been massively affected, arguably distorted by QE. And all those things are going to put great pressures. And we shouldn't expect those changes to happen easily. But like Charles, there's nothing any of us can do about it other than watch it. Yeah, the reason uh, I say so is that even as an investor, <coughs> you know, you can keep on asking, but almost every investor ultimately going to resign to the fact that nobody knows. Nobody even know whether it's going to affect liquidity or not affect liquidity. If it's going to affect liquidity, where is liquidity, how the liquidity, you ended up. I don't really think there's, uh, you know, maybe smart people who are beginning to do something quietly, but the people who are talking um, are not offering anything that I felt that I can rely on and making monetary decisions. Uh, Mr. Rio, uh, uh, from your perspective <coughs> as a former central banker, um, what are your thoughts then? Are, are you concerned or would you have any advice for... Uh, the incoming Fed chair? <laughs> uh, I think <coughs> that the, in general, I think you know, the, uh, the QE brought uh, some risks already. You know, it's, uh, uh, it, it, of course, the you know, emerging market have a huge capital inflows. So you can see uh, in the past few years, you can see the, all the asset prices are spiraling up very quickly and covering a lot of embedded internal <coughs> problems and issues. And, um, and, and uh, now there's the statement from the Fed saying that we will taper off the QEs. And in long run, it's a good thing because tapering off the QE, QE shouldn't be like this because you can't never <coughs> 
give the QEs, quantitative easing, uh, like this, and uh, give the very extra real interest rates and uh, keep pumping the money to the very inefficient <coughs> markets. And then the banks will piling up their legacies and then buying back the treasuries. What's the use of that? Nowadays, the market in US, in the banking alone, the industries, they have more than two trillion US dollars. Okay? You know, the purchase of the treasuries. So the liquidity they're coming back. But there's only a tiny portion will go to the real economies. And uh, uh, certain portions of certain sectors are beneficiary. And the moreover, there are only 1% or 2% of Americans are beneficiaries. Are beneficiaries. So that is, is something. But nowadays, if you have a very quick and a swift tapering off, or even follow the way the very strong reverse operations to dry up the liquidity, so I mentioned more than 2 trillion US dollars in the markets then definitely it will brought huge waves to capital, currency, <coughs> liquidities, and commodity markets in, in across the globe. Uh, and, and newly emerging markets in particular will be suffering with the capital outflows and the greater rotation of the risk appetites because in, uh, in these areas, a lot of people are doing the carry trade nowadays, and they, they can borrow the Japanese yen at minimum cost, right, and swap into the, uh, the, the, the offshore RMB and uh, Hong Kong dollars and Singapore dollars and other currencies and to invest in their countries. Even with China, we have a very tough foreign change control scheme. Still, you can use the QD and RQV quotas to do such a, a business via those channels. <coughs> so you can see the shock is over there. The liquidity trap we witnessed in last May and June, and by the end of last year, and the very beginning of this month, the very year, it's real. And if you look at the drop and the devaluation of the currencies <coughs> of Turkey, India, Indonesia, and many other newly emerging markets. It's highly connected with such a waves. So people got to be pre well prepared about that. And uh, even <coughs> with uh, the countries with much better fundamentals, they suffered from such a huge rotation, great rotation and a great capital flight. So, uh, but the, the bottom line is that what I should say, we could never see is a rerun of Asian financial crisis, no. Because uh, today the Asian is different from that in 1997. Uh, we have uh, much thicker foreign change reserves, at least five times for <coughs> each individual country. In every, on average, it's five to 10 times thicker the cushion is much thicker than before the foreign change reserves. The banking industries are resilient and the better, more resilient than the better. External data, debt is, is much minimal and very small. And the central banks are very sensitive about these risks. But anyway, having said that, I didn't mention <coughs> that the suffering shouldn't be here with us. So we got to um, keep an eye, our eyes open widely the whole year round because maybe by the end of this year, you, you, you can you just see the UST, <coughs> uh, 10 years UST, the treasury bond, the interest rate we mentioned that at this exact time last year is only 1.2%. But by the end of last year, it's 3%. It's already doubled. And by the end of this year, this coming year, in my eyes, definitely will be approaching 4%, if not higher. And the historic record could tell us USD could be reaching from 1.4% to 6%. Think about the people who are doing the carry trade. 
and the unwinding effects and spillover effects will be huge in, in many countries, not only in the newly emerging markets. So we got to make sure that starting from next year, moreover, they were doing the reverse operations to dry up the liquidity from the markets, cause the US dollars much strengthened and the interest rate very much higher. So that is something happened in one to two years, and we couldn't see even longer because US economy is not so strong, fundamentally speaking, in long run. But anyway, that is a market move. It's a herd effects in the market. So we got to keep our eyes open about that. Uh, the king solution is that every individual country in Asia got to be careful in their fundamentals. You know, the current account the deficit, you got to narrow that, fiscal <coughs> burdens and debt ratios and so on and so forth to leave the confidence in the market and leave the market open and, uh, and be careful about the policies and tools you are using. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Liu, before we go out to, to the audience a question, I wonder if I can shift once more to, to China, because in fact you, you, you talk about the need for countries in Asia to, to get uh, a handle on their debt ratios, et cetera. There's been a lot of news of late uh, concerns about the debt levels in, in China. So I'm wondering if I get from the panel your thoughts at the moment on um, all the discussion about the debt levels, particularly of local governments uh, in China, um, there's been a lot of discussion about the extent of the shadow banking uh, sector. Um, what are your concerns um, going forward this year? Uh, maybe, maybe start with you, uh, uh, okay. Mr. Liu. Uh, well, the, 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 the China, obviously, I'm quite <coughs> interested in hearing Jim and Liu, um, but we, we need to really understand what's the question we are asking. You know, first of all, do we, uh, do we really have a a debt problem. Uh, and uh, second <coughs> is, is it really serious enough that it could actually uh, break into a problem? And, uh, and what sort of problem it's going to potentially become? And three, if a problem does arise, is there a reasonable, easy way to fix it without creating structural and uh, systematic problems? I think uh, we don't have answer on any one of the three questions, even on the beginning. And, you know, if you look at the government <coughs> debt as a percent of GDP, it seems to be okay, probably even on the low end, if you <coughs> compare with, uh, you know, some of our, uh, the, the comparable economies in the world. But you don't really, but that is some, that's something like a 53, you know, 50 some percent. But you don't add, you know, SOE debt. Do you think ultimately China's political <coughs> system is such that the SOE ultimately is on the impl implicit uh, a sovereign <coughs> guarantee, and if they all go busted, the government has no choice but um, you know, you know, hold it. So if you put all of that <coughs> together, you actually could end up with a pretty meaningful number and is actually start to put China onto uh, uh, you know, uh, much more to the charts of a problem issues rather than if just purely look at the government debt. That's so we, you know, we need to really, people need to understand and need to make a decision as to whether or not that's really which number you should be looking at in order to see whether we are in danger territory or not. Second is, <coughs> even if you're there, is China really, uh, you know, do we really have a problem? You know, one school of thought is going to say we do have a big problem. The money is being flown out of the banking system. There's a massive shadow banking because the banks, you know, have very limited tools of making money other than the interest <coughs> spread, you know, so they don't have a competitiveness. Then the government, uh, you know, the central bank and the regulator have only very few levers to, to, to you know, to, 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 to control them, you know, control them on reserves, you know, and, you know, control them. The reserve for many banks considered to be a tax. Basically, you automatically take 20%, 22% of their balance sheet saying you can't do anything with it, put it into the central bank, right? So. And then the bank have a, other than interest rate spray, you know, really have very little way of making any money. So as a result of it, you know, the policies seems to be really making the banking <coughs> sector very safe. But that means that massive amount of deposit, which have to find something to do with the money, ended up flowing into areas where this is exactly what happened in the U.S. It's just that the real problem <coughs> is never in the banking system. It is in the non-banking system. 
So we do have a big problem waiting to happen. But uh, equally, another economist is going to come and say, oh, no, 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 nothing is going to happen. China is Depends like, on uh, China is a consolidated, you know, treat China <coughs> as a company. It's a consolidated balance sheet. Whatever problem this local government did yeah. with the bank, with the subways, with all the things that are money sunk in it, but the land belongs to the government on the right, on this pocket. So even if the subway never make any money, but all the subway, when we build the land around the subway, start to really appreciate massive land. As long as the government can take land from peasants and is able to sell them, the government is fine. So on a consolidated basis, government is never going to be a problem. Okay, well, you know, depending on how which you believe. Even if it's a problem, what do we do? I mean, obviously in the US and the others, <coughs> when you have a system where people literally will have to bankrupt, then, you, you know, then obviously you know that the system could really <coughs> cease up. In China, do you have that problem? Do you really have, uh, you know, so one school of thought would say absolutely, the banks are already reformed, they already listed companies, the government is not going to do anything <coughs> about it. The other school is saying the government will never ever, because of the political system, because of the political source of uh, uh, legitimacy of the power, is such that the government will never let things go, uh, you, know, and, you know, go through a cliff. So in the end, this is all going to be bailed out. We just kick the can down the road, massive moral hazard for the next generation, but that's what it is going to happen, and you know you have to worry. So I don't really know. I don't know which one. I, 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 I'm so encouraged now. Um, so Kano, um, uh, I'm, you, you were just in Beijing, and uh, you're uh, a director of ICBC. I'm wondering your perspective on this. It's very difficult as a non-executive director of any bank <laughs> to actually understand the realities. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I think that's something that everybody should, should uh, make. Uh, this is an occasion for honesty, I think. Um, I actually am not worried because I take a view of the <coughs> consolidated balance sheet of, of China. Um, that's a statement which is only true at a very high level. There are worries that anybody should have about concentration risk, exposure, <coughs> particular exposure to particular uh, sectors. Um, but in terms of the macroeconomics, I don't think I am as worried about China as I am about some of the more, more established countries. Now, if you look at the total debt <coughs> levels in the US, in the UK, in continental European countries, those are very high debt levels. And if you look, what have we done in the UK over the last five years? Our economic policy has been pretty traditional. We have dealt with our problems by inflating them away, by a level of inflation which has been twice that of the target set for, for the Bank of England <coughs> over the last five years. Um, and we've dealt with it by devaluation. Now, those have been the classic classic instruments that have been used for a very long time. And I think one of the interesting questions is not just China, but whether the debt levels that we have generally are debt levels that are going to result in high levels of inflation across the world, which despite the work of central banks, is going to come and bite us. Thank you. Um, Cleo, um, your perspective, please, on, on your concern. Uh, yeah. The, the, the good news is that, the, uh, let me mention the bad news at first. The bad news <laughs> is that the loan made to the local <coughs> government platforms we call the used to call the UDIC, Urban Development and Investment Vehicle, the UDIC <coughs> uh, amounted uh, almost 11 trillion RMB <coughs> by end of year 2010. That's a figure coming from very early in year 2011 uh, by the State <coughs> Auditor Bureau. And uh, now, by the end of last year, in two years, and uh, they announced uh, they renewed the figure to 21 <coughs> trillion RMB, uh, from 11 trillion <coughs> to 21 trillion. So it, you can see it's a sharp increase um, in the, in the legacy of the debt over there. So uh, in my eyes, it, it could be a big problem if non-performance loans, uh, non-performance <coughs> assets arises. That's the bad news. <coughs> the good news is that 
Chinese story is becoming more and more transparent. And originally, we haven't got such a data. But now, it's, we have the data, and it's published. And the government keep monitoring the data, and to province by province, and uh, UDIC by UDIC. So this is a good approach, and put everything under the same light. And then automatically the question in people's mind is that, what are you doing with the money? And can we get the money back? Is that economically viable <coughs> for the project you are doing? So that is the good news. The second good news is that third plenum decided we will carry out the fiscal and taxation reform. And in that paragraph, they said, the legislature in the future will ensure that the local government <coughs> funding job will strictly abide by, by the rules and the laws. So that means we will nourish new rules and the laws if the local government, if the government, the local government in China are very, so very big differences in between. So if they are allowed to raise the money, and uh, if allowed, what kind of limitations will be. So uh, the law and the rules will express the, in a very clear way in the future. And uh, also, <coughs> the statement coming from central government said, the local government, if they want to do the funding, they got to prepare, prepare, they got to prepare three statements. One is uh, the, the, you know, their balance sheets, the second is the profit and loss accounts, and the third is the cash flow statements. And also, they said they will be audited <coughs> by the local Congress, okay, and the same level. And uh, nowadays, the controversial camp saying the same level uh, supervision is not enough. So there are maybe the alternative option is uh, the central government <coughs> or auditor, auditoring directly or, uh, uh, or monitoring directly about such a behavior. And the providing the information on the official SAT, the website, will be done in, in line with other tax authorities like Hong Kong SAR here. Everything must be put on the website and uh, including important the court cases and the restructuring cases. So uh, if all these stories will be delivered, that could be a very good news. Moreover, we have a very interesting <coughs> legacy policy over there. It's a good 20 years we have the division policy of the revenue, 25, 75 between the local <coughs> government and the central government. It's as far back as 1994. At that time, the central government has little resources. But some provinces along the Chinese coastlines are comparatively rich. So the policies were over, over there. Just imagine, could you have a policy good enough to last 20 years without any refurbishment? So, I think the central government is the recheck their thoughts, how to divide their homework done by the central government and the local government, and what kind of revenue division should be following, and what kind of tax could be local, what kind of tax will be central, or how we divide that. So all this stuff are uh, nourishing and hatching. Uh, so I just give you the piece of information so we can watch them, monitoring the process. If we can deliver such a, such a stuff in a healthy way and in quick pace, please don't worry about the Chinese economy because not to mention the huge resources held by SOEs. If we can push forward the realignment of SOEs, along the market move and the market economy. If we are determined to carry out the reform, the restructuring of SOEs, we, we still have a lot of resources to mobilize, to bridge the gap 
Uh, finally, uh, having said that, <coughs> I'm still very worrisome, not about the debt ratio, but I worry about credit culture. And this is something missing in China. We got to nourish that, and uh, as the sooner the better. Thank you very much. I just close by saying that I think one of the key points that has been brought up that perhaps um, um, we, we could have discussed a bit more was the need for international cooperation. Um, I've done some work with the G20, and um, I think we can all agree that when the crisis was really at its hottest, um, the G20 um, moved in a coordinated way, and that is to their credit. But of course, when, when things get better, um, you know, you embrace in a crisis and you embrace less when things are getting better. As you're falling over the cliff, you want to hug everybody. But once you're backing off from the cliff, then maybe uh, it's every man for himself and you do things that are more in your national interest. But one could argue um, that it's at this time when so many things are happening with the taper in China, in emerging markets, in Japan, uh, here in Hong Kong, that this is the time when we need, in fact, more international cooperation. Um, and how that happens, um, it's a difficult question. So with that, I, I turn back to the, the warden. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I think my real job at this point is to make sure everyone gets thanked properly. I want to begin by expressing my very great thanks to the three discussants, first of all. We've had a very fascinating discussion. Uh, a couple of points that particularly struck me. First of all was the recognition of the suffering that these crises have brought. When, you know, I, I'm a European and I look to what young Spaniards, young Greeks, there are many of them who've never had a job. They're not going to get a job unless they emigrate. So it, it really is something very real. And yet, you also remind us, we, this, you know, things are bad, but we never actually went over the edge or anything. So, so that's sort of some small comfort, I suppose, for all the, the suffering that we have at the moment. In terms of the intellectual thing that I think I have learned most tonight, it's the thing that you summarized with actually yourself there, Al. And that is the fact that there are so many different economies here with different <coughs> dynamics in different places and the consequent need that we have to have international cooperation between these different economies. And we learnt this, we could see it as it were, as worked examples as the discussion ranged over the European Union, the United States, China, and we touched on the United Kingdom a little bit. So that was really very, very helpful. Um, we have some particular presents to give out now. So in Merton, we always try and thank people properly as well. The, the first two presents are for MK and for Charles. So if you give them a round of applause for their work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have something also for Callum, but... Callum, I have a special word for you as well, because so you are a discussant, but behind the scenes, Callum has done an awful lot to help this event happen. In fact, I think it's not an overstatement to say that were it not for Callum, we would not have had a Hong Kong Merton conversation. So an extra special round of applause, please, for Callum. And Callum, <laughs> you proceed very carefully. <laughs> My next vote of thanks really moves to you, Al, because you have been a wonderful moderator. At the Royal Society, I used to have to be a moderator, and I don't know, you can tell me afterwards how you found it, but I used to sit on the edge of my chair sometimes, wondering if the conversation was just going to dry up and would the right word come to me, or would the whole room freeze for a minute, or something like that? I think it was Charles spoke of finances being like oil. Al, I think you've been the oil of the evening, and you've kind of lubricated the discussion, and we're very, very grateful to you for that. And so we have a present for Al as well. There we are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And almost finally, I want to thank all of you as well. We wouldn't have had a Merton conversation without you. And in particular, there's been your questions, which were very stimulating as well. And most of all, 
you've kicked off the Merton celebrations for our 750th. So bravo and thank you for that. And in conclusion, I want to wish you all a happy new year, Chinese or otherwise, and thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>